some videos and Andrew um, led us in worship so it's great to be back here today. Just before we begin just a few announcements. The first is that um, our Watts magazine, our church magazine um, has been hopefully been posted around to most of the doors. I know some of you have been um, kindly taking them and posting them around. If you've not got one yet though or you'd like to give one to a friend, we've got some spare copies and they can be um, taken um, on the way out. It's full of all the information of things that have been going on during lockdown but also things that are upcoming as well. One of those that is um, upcoming is our, or has already started, is our Monday evening um, focus or Bible study on the themes of Advent, love, hope, joy and peace. Um, and they, that takes place every Monday evening, seven o'clock on Zoom. The details are in the church magazine or you can contact me for more info. If you've got access to the internet, access to Zoom, you're very welcome to join us. You don't have to know everything about the Bible, you can just feel free to sit there and listen to others um, discussing and listening um, along. You're very welcome to that. And one more thing um, is that, as many of us know, um, Brian, unfortunately, our organist, is um, leaving us at the end of this year, but we'd like to give him a gift um, as uh, a thanks for the many years of service to our church here. And um, so on your way out or on other future Sundays up to Christmas, you're able to give a um, response and thankful response to Brian and his able leading of, of us in worship, but also funerals and weddings and other special services as well. So it's a collection plate on the way out today, um, or you can speak to me if you'd like to give in another way um, to Brian. So that's um, this week and the next couple of weeks up to Christmas as well. So if you haven't brought money today, um, you can still do so in future weeks. We begin a series this week looking at um, some of the songs of the Bible, um, the songs that um, tell us about the story of Christmas that Luke records for us. And today we're going to look at the story of Mary. But first, um, we're going to um, have a call to worship and we're going to say that um, together. Are you able to go to the first slide, Neil? Oh, we should come up. There we go. It's the song As We Are Gathered, but we're just going to say it together. Um, a reminder that Jesus is here amongst us as we worship him together. So let's say these words together. As we are gathered, Jesus is here. One with each other, Jesus is here. Joined by the Spirit, washed in the blood, part of the body, the church of God. As we are gathered, Jesus is here. One with each other, Jesus is here. Our first song this morning is going to be Tell Out My Soul, and that's um, written uh, based on the words of Mary's song that we'll be looking at um, this morning. Um, Brian will play verses, uh, just verse 1, and we will say together um, verse 2, and Brian will close off. Let's stand as we worship God, we will say verse 2 together.
Sunday school. Thank you very much. Woo! It's a reminder that if we move closer to Christmas and we move closer to the coming of Jesus the first time that we remember, but also the coming of Jesus at some point in the future. It might be this afternoon, it might be thousands of years into the future, but Jesus promises that he will return, come to make all things new. We're going to join our hearts in prayer. We'll close with the Lord's Prayer that will appear on the screens. Let us pray. Father, we do indeed rejoice as we move closer to Christmas, that you're the God who comes close to us, that you're the God who enters into the lives of folk like Mary and Joseph, of the humble shepherds and the cast out ones, but also the wise and important ones like the wise men. We see throughout the life of Jesus how he cares for all people, most particularly the forgotten about, neglected Those who don't appear on our TV screens and uh, have lots of fame, but the ordinary, the the normal, the folk just like us here today. Lord, we praise you this morning. Our hearts rejoice in God, our Savior, for you also remember us. You show your mercy and your grace to even the likes of us. We celebrate this morning that you have done great things for us, that you're the God who has saved us and rescued us. You're the God who's journeyed with us in all of our trials and tribulations throughout life. That you are our anchor for the soul, our hope, our rock, the thing that we can build our lives upon. Lord, we rejoice that you show mercy to us, that you have stretched out your mighty arm, that you have loved us with a tender and compassionate love, lifting up the lowly, filling the hungry with good things, that you keep your promises to us, that you have been our help and our shield. Lord, in our worship this morning, as we gather with brothers and sisters in Christ here today, but also with our brothers and sisters across all the world in whatever church and community they gather in today, whatever language they speak, whatever worship music they listen to or sing, whatever generation that they're from, from all years past and years to come. We join with all of your people, praising you and worshipping you, for you're worthy of all of our praise. Lord, bless us and remind us again of who you are. For we pray all of these things in the name of the Christ child who comes close to us at Christmas and in whose words we say together, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Peter is going to come up and uh, read from God's Word for us. Um, if you want to turn with me, it's in Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 46, or it will be on the screens. But we're looking, as I say, at Mary's song um, this morning. So Luke chapter 1, reading from verse 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord. And my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. 
He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones. But he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. But he has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. One of the first signs of Christmas is surely the change of music in the shops and on the radio. No one announces when it's going to happen. No one says today on this date you can finally have your Christmas music. Perhaps this year it might have started a wee bit earlier as we, uh, the shops want us to feel um, Christmassy and want us to buy more, obviously with the lack of um, shopping being done earlier in the year. But all of a sudden, One moment we're listening to normal everyday songs, then suddenly we hear Noddy Holder shouting out, It's Christmas! And in the run-up to Christmas this year, we were looking at the original Christmas songs. Not Noddy Holder's, not Bing Crosby, but the ones that Luke records for us around the birth of Jesus from Mary, Zechariah, Simeon, and the angels on the hillsides. Luke records them because they reveal great truths to us about the good news of Christmas. That's why our series this Christmas is called great joy because all of these songs tell us about why God and Jesus brings us great joy. All these four groups of people thought that this baby born at Christmas was bringing great joy. So we begin with Mary and the Magnificat as it is often called. Is it working? No, it's not. Your next slide. It's often called the Magnificat and that's just the, the first word in the, the Latin translation just mean to magnify. Um, and that's what Mary says, my soul magnifies or makes much of um, the Lord. Now, we don't have time to focus on the background to this song, but in short, I'm sure most of you know it anyway, but um, I encourage you to go home this afternoon and read the whole of Luke chapter 1. Just a few minutes it will take you to read the whole of this story. But in short, a young lady um, called Mary is told by a heavenly angel from God that she will bear a son who's going to be the promised Messiah for God's people. In other words, he'll be the saviour of humanity, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. She finds out this child is not going to be any ordinary child, but the child within her, or it's about to become a growth in her, is extraordinary. For instance, it's not conceived by natural means, by, by extraordinary supernatural means. We see the interweaving of the ordinary, a young lady, and the extraordinary, the human and the divine, the natural and the supernatural. She goes and hangs out with her cousin Elizabeth, who's much older than her, and is also bearing a child. And Elizabeth says, this child within you, I know, is something special. And Mary bursts into song and says, my soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Or, if you like, she sings, tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. We see a heart that is thankful because God has been good to her. There's lots that we could look at in this song, but I just want to focus on three words this morning. Mindful, mighty, and merciful. That God is mindful, that God is mighty, and that God is merciful. If you had your Bible with you, or if you remember the reading, these three words come straight from the text. I've not imposed them upon it. It's the words that Mary says herself, that God has been mindful to her, that he is mighty, and that he is merciful. So first, God is mindful. Initially, she speaks in personal terms in verse 48. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now, all generations will call me blessed. In other words, she's saying, God could have found anyone in the whole world far better than me. A rich, noble, powerful queen from faraway lands who lives in a palace. But he hasn't chosen to do so. Instead, he came to me, a lowly maiden, a teenage girl from the back and beyond. Because Mary is not that important. If Mary hadn't been the mother of Jesus, no one would know she ever existed. 
Now, of course, she's important to our family and our friends, as our family and friends are important to us. But like probably most of us, no one outside of our social circle will miss us or know much about us beyond that small social circle. But Mary says, God has been mindful of me. In other words, he's taken thought of me, he's cared for me, he's kept remembrance of me. In the same way, we keep remembrance for Remembrance Day and the conflicts and those who've lost their lives. Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, for he's taken care of me, he's taken thought of me, I am in his remembrance. But also she says in verses 54 to 55, he's remembered, he's helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever and ever. In other words, God's not just mindful of you and me, but mindful of all of his people. If you remember the story of Abraham back in Genesis 12, we see Abraham is called out of darkness into God's kingdom. And God says to him, Abraham, you're an old man, but I'm going to give you descendants. And out of your descendants, a great blessing will come upon the whole world. And from that, a future king will come who will take away all the darkness in the world, all the turmoil, all the stress and anxiety, all the COVID and all the struggles and politics and so on. All of that will be gone through you. You will bring a blessing. And so all the way through the Old Testament, we see the unveiling of this promise. We see Abraham having his child and then so on and so on. And the prophets come along and they say, God is still mindful of you. And people listen to the prophets And they hear Isaiah say, for unto you a child is going to be born, a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulders and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. His influence and reign, there will be no end. His kingdom will never cease. And the people at that time would have had a Bible study and they just said, Isaiah is pointing forward to something. This must be an unveiling of what Abraham was told by God, that There's going to be a blessing, and it's going to be a child that's going to be given to us who's going to bring around this great blessing in the future. A child will be born, a son will be given to us. The psalmists also speak of it. It says in Psalm 8, What is mankind that you're mindful of us? In other words, he says, God, the whole heavens and earth are amazing. Look at all of creation, and yet you care about me? and my neighbor, and my friend, and those who live along the street from me? How on earth do you care about us when you've got all of creation to care about? You see, the greatness of God is not revealed in how distant he is from us, but how intimate he is with us. In other words, we tend to think of, if you're isolated from the rest of humanity, then you tend to be better than us. Because the more money you earn, the longer a driveway you can have, the further you are away from the likes of me and you. The more money you have, the more security you can buy, the fancier equipment you can have, the fancier stuff you can have, far away from the rest of us. The more status you acquire, the more you can take yourself away from humanity. People, if they want to speak to you, they have to go through someone else. In other words, for instance, think about Buckingham Palace. If you want to go and see the Queen at Buckingham Palace, you don't get to just knock on the door like you can to all of us here today or phone it up. You have to go through security and various meetings to get anywhere close to the Queen. And everyone comes around Buckingham Palace and stands at the end of the driveway and the gates and says, wow, the Queen is in there. She's so remote from me. She is so great. She has security. She's far away, isolated from us. But you and me are not like that. The greatness of God is not revealed in how far and distant he is from us, but how close he is to us, i.e. in the person of Jesus. C.S. Lewis, the great writer, said, God has landed on an enemy-occupied planet and he's landed in human form. Why? Because he's mindful of us. He's mindful of us. If you were to turn back your Bibles a few pages, you would get to the middle of the Bible where The Old Testament finishes at the end of Malachi and you get the blank page or two and it might say the New Testament and you turn the page and begins Matthew's Gospel. But in those blank pages or two you have a period of 400 years of silence. No prophecies, no communication from God it seems like. And the people of God at that time for those 400 years 
the equivalent of the folk in the 1600s hearing something from God they're not again till today. And they must have thought, has God forgotten us or neglected us? After all, it says that people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Where is this light, God? Then suddenly a young woman is startled with the news. Mary, your favorite, highly favorite. You're going to bear the Messiah, the King of the world. And that evening she must have lain awake in bed, not being able to sleep, and pulled the covers up to her chin and said, maybe this is God being mindful of us. This is a promise from God. A child will be born, a son will be given to me. But look at her response. She doesn't say, I need to book a slot on the one show, or phone up Oprah Winfrey, or go and publicize what's happened to me in the papers. No, she falls on the floor in praise and declares in the depths of her soul, my soul magnifies the Lord, for he's been mindful of me, a lowly servant. So God is mindful of you and of me today. Whatever we're going through, he knows us and he loves us. The second thing is that God is mighty. In verse 48, Mary declares, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Before she expands on it in verses 51 to 53, he's performed mighty deeds with his arm, scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought in the rulers from their thrones. He's filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. You want next slide, Neil? But she gives us this picture in verse 51 of God showing strength with his arm. Of course, God is a spirit. He doesn't have an arm, but it's Mary describing for us what it's like that God has brandished a weapon against all the evil in the world. Mary seems to have a prophetic voice within her. She seems to recognize that this baby that's about to grow in her womb is going to bring around all of these things she's just said. That mighty deeds are going to be performed. The proud will be scattered. Rulers will be brought down from their thrones. The hungry will be filled and the rich will go away empty. In other words, life is going to be transformed through Jesus. Sometimes at our worship services here, we sing um, the Chris Tolan song called Our God. It says, Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God. It's kind of like Mary was saying, this God that is growing within me is powerful. Jesus is going to turn the world upside down. And so she says, the, scat- the pride will be scattered The scriptures call out our arrogance and our pride again and again. It says stop being proud, stop being arrogant. In fact, at the root of it, that's what most sin is. It's us thinking that we know better than God. God says don't lie and we think, well, I want to lie. God says don't do this and we go, well, I want to do this, God. I know you think you know what you're talking about, but I know myself best. Not you who made me, who's always knowing me, who's known everything. And the reason it's... Uh, say God calls out our pride is because so often we think that if we are just good enough or uh, nice enough, then that's what we need to earn eternal life. But actually that is so full of pride. The most humble thing you can say when someone says, are you going to heaven, is not, I hope so, but rather, I'm certain I'm going there. The most humble thing you can say is not, I hope so, but rather, I'm certain. Why? Because if you say, I hope so, what it sounds like you're saying is, I hope that I'm good enough. I hope that I've done enough stuff, that I've turned up to church enough times, or I've given enough money, or I've helped enough folk across the roads, or whatever else it might be. I hope that I've been a nice person. I hope that God likes me. In other words, you're believing that you are good enough. But saying, yes, I'm certain I'm going to heaven, is completely humble. Because it shows that I don't have anything to give to God, but he in Jesus has saved me. So next time someone says, are you going to heaven? Don't say you hope so, because that is so full of pride. Mary recognizes that as well. She knows that she's a sinner with nothing to offer God, but that God is coming to rescue her and other people. Jesus is coming to bring down rulers from our thrones. You just have to go through the Old Testament and see this happening over and over again. All throughout history, we see God saying to his people, a nation's going to come and this is going to happen, but I'm going to end them in time to come. 
Just look through the book of Daniel and many others, and it says nation comes after nation, but they all end up nowhere. Think of all the folk in your lifetime that have thought, well, I'm big and I'm mighty and I'm going to rule the world, whether it's Hitler or Idi Amin or many others who thought, I'm it, I'm all about it. I can remember um, the fall of Saddam Hussein and, or um, and many others who thought, I'm the one that's going to rule the whole world, and then nothing happens in the end. Only one kingdom will last forever. Only one king will rule over all. And thirdly, Jesus is going to send the rich away empty, but fill the hungry up with good things. How can the rich be empty and the empty become rich? Shouldn't it be the other way around? After all, the rich can buy what they want, eat what they like, go where they choose. But Jesus is going to cause a revolution where those who are last will be first and the first will be last, where the servant will become the served, where those who are sinners will be welcomed in with open arms into heaven. And the religious folk, and the religious folk will be sent and cast out from it. Paul comes to recognize this in the New Testament. When we first meet him in the Acts, he says, I'm, he's shown himself to be proud and arrogant. But Jesus comes to change his life. And he says in one of his letters, you know all the things that I really prize in my life, all the things that made me who I am, all of my I mean, qualifications, all of my standing in society, I regard them all, and he uses a swear word here, but he basically says, I regard them all as dumb. Because knowing Jesus is so much more than all of that. In other words, I've experienced a revolution. I once could have said, I'm so powerful, intellectual, so qualified, so significant. And now all of those things mean nothing to me. Because Jesus is so much more. Jesus has come to show that he is mighty. He is mighty indeed. Next slide. And lastly, God is merciful. Mary says God's mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. His mercy extends to those who fear him. To fear God is not to cower in fear like you might do, um, or a child might do something at Halloween, but rather to fear God is to love him, to trust him, to choose to obey God. And we see that's what happens with God's people. Because when God comes to us, He refuses to abandon us. He is a good shepherd. He's committed to his people throughout all generations. And that continues to you and me today in Bervy Church in 2020. In the future when Jesus returns, as I say, it might be this afternoon, it might be thousands of years from now, we will gather with all of God's people across all the centuries right back to Adam and Eve. And we'll see folk like Mary saying, I was a sinner just a servant of God's, but the holy God was merciful to me. And all around the throne of God, as Jesus has proclaimed as the Savior and the King, there will be these questions. Abraham, how come you are here in heaven? And Abraham will reply, because God's mercy was extended to me. And somebody else will say, Arab Christian from the West Bank, how come that you are here today? And he will say, because God's mercy was extended to me. And I see that you're here from Romania or Pakistan or China or Tuvalu or a hundred other places. How come? God's mercy extended to me. And there might even be some Scottish folk there. And they will say, God's mercy was extended to me. The same story across our lifespan and a centuries past and potentially into the future. Our God is mighty to save. His mercy was extended to us, his humble servants. And I hope that's the song we want our children and grandchildren to sing. That God was merciful to me. We want our loved ones, our neighbours, our friends, our colleagues to know and declare in the depths of our soul, God has been merciful to me. Today is an invitation to those who do not believe to bow down before his mindfulness, his might, and his mercy that is in Jesus. This translation says his mercy flows in wave after wave way through all the generations it keeps on flowing that in jesus we see a god that is mindful because he's not abandoned us in our sin but he's remembered us in our plight a god who's mighty because he defeats his forces of evil and a god who's going to cause a revolution a god who's shown us mercy by coming down to forgive us and make us new people we are called to bow down before the mindfulness the might and the mercy of god And when we do, may our souls say with Mary's, 
may it tell out the greatness of our Lord. Let us pray. Father, indeed, this morning we declare with Mary, we declare in our souls that you are a great and wonderful God who has been mindful of us, who is mighty for us, and is merciful towards us. Lord, help us this morning to remember this, to recall this in the coming days. Whatever we go through, whatever struggles we find ourselves in, that you are mindful of us, that you know us, that you love us, that you are here with us. Lord, remind us that you are mighty, that all the struggles in our life will one day seem as nothing because you have defeated sin. And in the future, we will find ourselves around your throne for you will have defeated the powers of darkness and evil. And why will we find ourselves in the throne, around that throne? Because you have shown your mercy towards us, not neglecting us, not abandoning us, but being kind to us in Jesus. So Lord, remind us today of your mindfulness, your might, and your mercy towards us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our next song, the praise group, are going to come up and uh, lead us in a Christmas classic, Joy to the World, as we're thinking um, about Jesus bringing joy to us at Christmas. No, sorry, sing the song of Emmanuel. That's a bust song. That's what I was confused there. Sing the song of Emmanuel. It's one we, we did last Christmas, and I know many of us um, enjoyed it, um, and we're going to do that again. Did you say we're going to stand in the final verse? Or say the final verse? Let's stand for the whole song, but um, the praise band will quiet the music for the third verse, and we'll see that together. Let's stand as we worship God. Sing me the song of Emmanuel. Join me in prayer again as we pray for our community and our world. Let us pray. Father, indeed we sing the song of Emmanuel, the God who has come close to us. And that is our hope and our, um, the thing that we can build our lives on. That you're not a far and distant away God. But that you're a God that comes close to us at Christmas, but indeed all throughout our lives. 
that you are God with us, God around us, God for us. We rejoice in your mindfulness, your might, and your mercy towards us, that you have shown us your steadfast love, that you have been faithful throughout all of our lives. Lord, we ask today that Mary's song might be heard throughout the ages, drowning out the din of Christmas chaos. May it be heard by the victims of violence, where there is war and conflict, or situations and relationships where violence takes place. May it ring out in the ears of the traumatized, those who live in situations far beyond our comprehension, living in refugee camps, living in war-torn areas, fearful of leaving their home. May it sing in the hearts of those who are stuck, unsure of the way forward, uncertain of what the next step in their journey of life might look like, troubled, bereaved, upset. May it be an earworm song of hope for those who feel like there is no hope, for those who don't see a way out of their current circumstances, for those whose lives have been turned upside down by COVID, by bereavement, by hurt and by pain. May it be the rally cry of the peace of aid agencies and those in those places where conflict and terrorism takes place. We're grateful that in our country these things don't so often happen. But recognizing for many around the world, conflict and violence, guns and bombs and bullets are an ordinary part of life. May the song of Mary nourish hope in the bellies of those whose harvests have failed, of those in our country who lockdown restrictions have meant their businesses are going bust. We pray for those who are fearful of the future. For those who have recently lost their job, those whose jobs might be on the line. May it be a song that stirs fear in the hearts of those who assume power. Lord, we praise you, we adore you, that you are the God that brings down rulers who are proud and full of themselves in their thrones. May you bring down more of them, bringing peace and hope to our country and to our world, we ask. Lord, may the promises of this song, of your mindfulness, of your might and your mercy, resound in our hearts this day. May it go with us as we live our lives this week. May it impact our streets, our homes and our community as you send us out to be people that rejoice in who you are and of what you've done for us in Christ. Bless us, we pray. For we ask all of these things in the name of Christ. Amen. A closing song this time is Joy to the World. Um, We will stand up again and uh, we'll say verse 1 and Brian will play the remaining verses for us. So let's stand as we have our closing song this morning. Joy to the World, the Lord has come. We'll say verse 1 together. Joy to the World, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and nature sing, and heaven and heaven and nature sing.
may the blessing of our God, who has been mindful towards you, who shows his might and his mercy to you today. May that God from Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and all your loved ones this day and forevermore. Amen. Please take a seat. And a reminder, um, on your way out, you can collect a a Watts magazine if you've not got one or take one to a friend. Um, But also, if you wish to give um, in thankfulness um, to Brian, um, then you're welcome to do so. Or if you've brought an offering um, for the church today, there's also a plate for that as well. God bless.